In this video, I want to go over example 8.1 um, from chapter 8. And in this example, um, what we have is we have a wire, which I'm going to draw as a cylinder. Um, and we're going to have a current flowing through the wire. Um, and work is going to be done. Um, and current is going to be flowing through it because I'm going to hook it up to this battery, or basically a voltage supply. So I have some supply V. Um, I have my wire, which has a radius of A. Um, and then I have a current flowing through this wire, and the current um, has a value of I. <clears throat> So what do we want to find is we want to find the power. We want to find the energy per time. So find what we've been writing as dW dt in this particular um, case. Okay, so if we do that, um, so we have a current flowing. We're essentially having an electric field, which is pointing in the direction of the current. So the electric field is pushing the current through um, the wire. Now having a current flow means that we're also going to be having a um, magnetic field. So we'd have a magnetic field which would be pointing perpendicular to it or basically this magnetic field is creating loops that loop around um, the current. So we have loops occurring around. So I'm going to draw the vector um, as that arrow. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, what are these values? Well, the electric field is just the potential divided by the length of the wire. So, this wire has a length L here. Um, and the magnetic field. I can calculate for a wire um, as mu zero, the current, divided by the circumference. So I would just use Ampere's law to figure out what the magnetic field is of a current carrying wire. <clears throat> but now that we have that, um, then we um, can write down the pointing vector. So S is one over mu zero um, e cross b like so and if i look at this um, e i'll go back and put in the vector direction i'll say it's moving in the x direction the magnetic field now is wrapping around the wire so it's perpendicular to that so the magnetic field is now in the y direction <clears throat> And so if I put all the stuff together, I get 1 over mu 0, V over L, mu 0, I over 2 pi A, X crossed into Y. <clears throat> okay, so um, X crossed into Y is now just minus Z. And the mu naughts cancel. So I would have vi over 2 pi a l in the minus z direction. Okay, so that's the pointing vector. Now we'll calculate the energy per time. And that's minus this integral of the pointing vector dotted into the area vector. <clears throat> um, so the minus signs cancel and I get the integral of um, S which is V I Z hat over 2 pi A L dotted into the area vector. So um, the area vector on the ends is in the x direction. So that's x hat, that's minus x hat. 
Um, but um, that is not, that's perpendicular to the z direction. So I don't have to worry about the ends. I only have to worry about the surface area um, around the wire. Um, so essentially, you know, the radial direction. And so what I get is vi over 2 pi al times the area. Um, and the area of that cylinder is the surface area of the cylinder is 2 pi al. So those terms cancel, and what we're left with is the power um, that's consumed by this uh, wire is the voltage times the current, um, or the potential times the current, which makes sense because that's actually the volt. That's the power that is generated by the battery. The power that you that a battery generates is the amount of voltage in the battery times the current that's flowing out of um, that battery. So in the end, um, the power consumed is equal to the power generated. Energy is conserved um, in there. OK. Um, so the next thing I want to do is to move on to um, the next section. section 8.2, where we start talking about momentum. So we've already discussed conservation of charge. We've discussed conservation of um, the uh, energy. Now let's start looking at conservation in terms of momentum, considering electric and magnetic fields. Um, so uh, now the author of the book, um, <clears throat> tells an interesting story of, say, um, two identical charges um, that are moving toward each other. So we could draw an axis system. And what I would have is particle uh, 1, so Q1. <clears throat> And I'd have another particle over here, Q2. And Q1 is moving with a velocity V1 along the negative x direction. And Q2 is moving with a velocity in the negative y direction. And if we look at um, what's going on, um, then Basically, what forces would we have? Well, we'd have the electric force along this diagonal line. Um, now, uh, we'd also have, um, let's say, a magnetic force. Um, so in this case, the B field created by the moving charge 2 creates B2, and the B field created by moving charge 1 creates B1, which means I would now get a magnetic force, um, Fm, and another magnetic force, um, like this. Okay, <clears throat> so in the end, um, so, so B1 was created by the motion of charge 1, and B2 was created by the motion of charge 2. Um, so the, um, so it turns out the electric forces are um, equal in opposite direction. So that seems to satisfy Newton's third law. So Newton's third law would say that um, the that there is a reaction force on each of them due to their electric forces, 
Um, basically, V, you know, Q1 is pushing on Q2, Q2 is pushing on Q1, so equal opposite. So that's good. Um, but the magnetic force, while well, equal in magnitude, because we're using the same, if we're using the same magnitude charges, um, is not in the same direction. Um, and so you would think that this violates um, Newton's third law, um, which in the end is going to mess up our conservation of momentum. So our conservation of momentum comes from uh, Newton's third law. So how are we going to solve this? And in order to solve it, um, then we have to look at, does the electric and magnetic fields carry momentum? Um, and so that's what we're going to do, um, let's say, in, this in the next video, is consider where, if the electric and magnetic fields are going to carry any um, momentum in them.